National Council of Provinces, Speaker of the National Assembly, Speakers of Provincial Legislatures, our Deputy Minister of International Relations, our Distinguished Presenter, Professor Eddie Maloka, House Chairpersons, Members and Members of Provincial Legislatures, Distinguished Guests. The NCP is indeed to be able to host you on our annual African Day virtual legacy lecture under the theme this year, like the theme from pandemic to endemic, building an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. This virtual Africa Day annual lecture, which we started in 2020, is convened to commemorate the 59 years of the founding of the Organization of African Unity in 1963. Africa Day is intended to celebrate and acknowledge the successes of the organization from its creation on the 25th May 1963 in the fight against colonialism and apartheid, as well as the progress that Africa as a whole has made while reflecting upon the common challenges that the continent faces in a global environment. As we know, it is in 2002 that it is actually changed to the African Union. We will be addressed today by Professor Eddie Maloka. He is the CEO of the African Peer Review Mechanism, the adjunct professor at the Wurzwaterrand School of Governance, Public and Development Management. Mr. Maloka was formerly and I'm introducing him already so that we can just continue after the chairperson have made his welcoming remarks. He was formerly a special advisor to the Minister of International Relations and Cooperation. He is also South Africa's special representative to the Great Lakes region. He was also a special advisor to the Deputy President of the Republic of South Africa an advisor of on governance, public administration, and post-conflict reconstruction of the NEPET Secretariat, African Legacy Delegate 2010 FIFA World Cup Organizing Committee, Chief Executive Officer of the Africa Institute of South Africa, political advisor to the Premier of Mpumalanga, to the Premier of Gauteng, also a lecturer at the Universities of Cape Town, and he had the Bachelor of Arts from Rhodes University of South Africa, and I'm in, in an MA in Development Studies from the Institute of Development Studies of the University of Geneva in Switzerland. His PhD in History he got from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Also have a postdoctoral fellowship from Princeton University, UJC in the United States of America. Professor Maluka is published extensively on aspects relating to the politics, history and development challenges facing Africa. We will also be having commentary from the Deputy Minister of International Relations and Cooperation, the Honorable Alvin Bortes, old colleague of mine and fellow comrade from the Liberation Movement, as well as Honorable Ambassador Mohamed Dangor. The chairperson of the NCOP will also do a few welcoming or giving us a perspective of the program of today. With that said and done, we are formally opening our lecture event for this commemoration of what we term Africa Day. We are Africans. We are one. Over to you, Honorable Chairperson, to welcome us all to this esteemed event. Over to you, Chairperson. Um, no, thank you very much, uh, uh, Honorable Lucas. Program Director, Deputy Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, Honorable Silva Lucas, our keynote speaker, the CEO of the African Peer Review and Mechanism, Professor Edima Luca, honorable <coughs> members of Parliament, members of the National Executive and Provincial Legislatures, representatives of the South African Local Government Association, SALGA, uh, distinguished guests, 
ladies and, 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 and gentlemen. Program Director, uh, Africa Day is the day uh, on which the continent of Africa commemorates the founding of the Organization of African Unity, the OAU, in 1963, uh, which OAU is now known as the African uh, uh, Union. In his book titled Africa Must Unite, President Kwame Nkrumah of, of Ghana, which was known in the earlier period as the Gold Coast, and became the first nation in Sub-Saharan Sub Africa to gain independence from colonial rule, has this to say about African uh, unity. Quote, there are those who maintain that Africa can, cannot unite because we lack the three necessary ingredients uh, for, a, for unity a common race, culture, and language. It is true that we have for centuries been divided. The territorial boundaries dividing us were fixed long time ago, often quite arbitrary by the colonial powers. Some of us are Muslims, some are, are, are Christians, Many believe in traditional tribal gods. Some of us speak French, some English, some Portuguese, not to, to mention millions who speak only one of the hundreds of uh, different African languages. We have uh, acquired cultural differences which affect our outlook and condition uh, our political development. All this is inev inevitable due to our historical background. Yet in spite of this, I am convinced that the forces making the unity far outweigh those which divide us, close quote. The establishment, establishment of the OAU in 1963 marked the beginning of a long pursuit for the unity of the continent and for the political and economic emancipation of its people, as well as cooperation amongst them. The Pan-African movement sought to restore the dignity of Africans against slavery, colonialism, and all forms of racism and racial exploitation. In 1996, on the occasion of the adoption of the South African Constitution, the last African country to be freed, uh, then Deputy President um, Mbeki corroborated Nkrumah's sentiments about Af African unity when he said that he owes his being to the hills and, and the valleys, the mountains and the plains, the rivers, the deserts, the trees, the flowers, the seas, and the ever-changing seasons that define the, the face of our native land. Mbeki went on to speak about the use of race and color to enrich some and impoverish others. The corruption of minds and souls in the pursuit of a, an ignoble uh, effort to perpetrate a veritable crime against, against humanity. And the concrete expression of the denial of the dignity of human being emanating from co conscious, systematic and uh, systemic and systematic op oppressive and repressive activities of other human beings. On the launch of the African Union and Agenda 2063, it was in 2002 that the African leaders decided to launch the AU in order to build on the work of the OEU. This followed the, re the realization that it was now important to work for the increased cooperation and integration of African states to drive Africa's growth and economic development. 
One of the concrete expressions of this vision was the adoption of Agenda 2063 on the occasion of celebra celebrating OAU and or AU Golden Jubilee in 2013. Program Director, Agenda 2063 is a strategic long-term planning instrument for the development of Africa. It is a concrete manifestation of the Pan-African drive for unity, self-determination, freedom, progress, and collective prosperity. Its goals and priorities include, uh, amongst others, the following, a high standard of living, quality of life and well-being for all citizens, well-educated edu citizens and skills revolution, transformed economies, world-class infrastructure that crosses Africa, preservation of peace, security, and stability, and healthy, well-nourished citizens. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has cri crippled the continent's resolve to focus on these priority areas as resources had to be diverted to stem the tide of the pandemic. As if this was not enough, as we speak, the effects of climate change continue to batter our countries, further exposing our, our people to hunger and suffering. In particular, the COVID-19 pandemic has greatly exposed the economic vulnerability of African countries, as well as the weaknesses of the health and food systems. In recognition of this reality, the AU has declared 2022 as the year of the nutrition, ostensibly to strengthen social protection systems and safeguard access to food and nutrition for the most vulnerable people. And it is for this reason, Program Director, that we must appreciate the subject of today's Africa's Day lecture, which is from, from pandemic to endemics, building an inter integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. This theme, which, we can, which, which will, will be carried over in a debate in the National Council of Provinces this afternoon, entrenches the Pan-African vision that is anchored on integration, prosperity, and, and peace. Program Director, one of the organs of the AU the Pan-African Parliament seeks to ensure the full participation of Afri African peoples in the development and economic, economic integration of the continent. Our forebears had sought to use the Pan-African movement as a, ve a vehicle to empower citizens to take part in shaping the continent's development trajectory. Without development that is embedded in the community interventions, Africa will not see the integration, prosperity, and peace she is yearning for. On the need for strengthening interventions such as uh, the African continent free trade, trade area, Africa and its development remain a central objective of the South Africa's international perspective and policy. As such, we must work hard to strengthen the interventions such as the African Continental Free Trade Area, which seeks to integrate prosperous and peaceful Africa that is driven by its own citizens. Accordingly, we need to create a conducive environment for the implementation of the Continental Free Trade Area. As part of that, we must, among other things, fight the explo exploitation and abuse of foreign migration into South Africa by Afrophobic right-wing organizations and tendencies, which lead to, amongst others, the strained relations amongst Africans. Of course, the country must deal with illegal immigration in a decisive manner, especially given its impact on schools, health facilities, housing, water, and sanitation, electricity, and business uh, infrastructure. On dealing with conflicts, building an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa 
also requires that we deal with uh, sources of conflict uh, in the continent, such as in Ethiopia, the insurgency in Cabo Del 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 Delgado province uh, in Mozambique, and the, re the return of coups, as seen recently in Burkina Faso, in Mali, uh, uh, which has seen two military coups since 20, 2020 and Guinea. Underscoring the need to, to work for peace and stability to facilitate development in the continent, researchers have put the number of coups and attempted coups in Africa from various times of independence of its countries at over 200. They say that there was a coup attempt every 55 days in the 1960s and the 1970s. And that over 90% of African states had a coup experience. In conclusion, as we recall the pioneers of African unity, among them Pre President Kwame Nkrumah, who argued that the forces for unity far outweigh those which, which, which divide us. We, we must do well, we'll do well to remember that the future of our native land is in our hands. We carry the responsibility to navigate disasters and setbacks so that future generations could inherit a continent that represents a dynamic force in the global arena. To achieve this goal would require that beyond the COVID-19 pandemic and in the midst of the other new and recurring disasters, we must continue to address the many impediments in our pursuit of a, of a better director. Please allow me to, to welcome the presenters and all the participants uh, to this Africa Day lecture. And I do really appreciate the opportunity uh, to have made uh, these few, few remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson of the NCOP. Thank you very much for the extensive background that you gave to this lecture and to this presentation. And thank you very much for welcoming us all here. I will, we will continue with the program and we are going to now request our keynote speaker. And we also want to acknowledge the Chief Whip when he requested Moai us to invite you, Professor Maloka, because we feel that you can make a very, very uh, useful contribution to the battle of ideas and to our discussion of Africa as a continent and how we need to develop our continent. Professor Maluka, you are more than welcome. I don't know, is it the first time that you are addressing the NCOP? But usually with us at the NCOP, when you start, you never finish. So it might be that we will invite you again and again. So over to you, Professor Maluka. You are the keynote speaker today on this that become something that we have been doing since 2020 and it's now part and parcel of the NCOP agenda. Over to you, Professor Maluka. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy uh, Chairperson of the NCOP and our, our distinguished moderator. Let me also um, um, uh, recognize the Chairperson of the NCOP um, uh, Mr. Masson, Honorable Masson, Honorable Members, ladies and gentlemen, and please allow me to stand on the protocol which was read out by our moderator. And let me also wish you a heavy, happy Africa Day. Let me begin by thanking our parliament for hosting this Africa Day public event, and also for inviting me to be part of this distinguished panel that will be engaging us this afternoon. Deputy Minister Bwates, uh, I saw you. Thank you very much for being here and for the energy that you continue to inject into our foreign policy since you have been uh, your appoint appointment. And I also wish to recognize my dear elder brother, Ambassador Dango. You are now at the NCOP, but uh, we used to be colleagues together at the Department of International Relations and Cooperation. We worked together when you were Ambassador in Libya and later we became neighbors as advisors to the former Minister of International Relations in South Africa. 
South African Parliament is a big player in the foreign policy space as an institution, but also in the role that honorable members play in holding the executive accountable. I've been privileged in the past to participate in the work of your dynamic com uh, committees. Today's topic is not about parliament or its role, at least directly, but an opportunity for us to reflect on the state and future of our continent as fellow Africans. The topic we have been given is, as read out by, by the chairperson of the NCOP, from pandemics to endemics, building an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. This topic is expecting too much from us and reminds me of two African proverbs. The first one says, no matter how old you may be, the future will always be ahead of you. That is, you will never reach the other side or the other end of the future to know it before it happens. For me, with my tall height, this proverb is calling me to order, not to start thinking that my height will enable me, like, as, like at the soccer match, to see over the heads of others into the future. For now, and in this session, we can only rely on human tools like projections, probability scenarios, and a deceptive concept of speculation to attempt to peep into the future and to take our chances. After all, we can't function without trying to predict what is likely to happen next. The second proverb is not just philosophical. It also touches on a difficult subject in theoretical physics. It says, a bird that flies off the earth and lands on an end, end hill is still on the ground. Close quote. Are the past, present, and the future three distinct temporal zones, or as some claim in physics and philosophy, just different locations, different points on the same mountain? I will not attempt to answer this difficult question. I don't even have enough grounding in this subject to attempt to do so. I will, I will, however, with the little knowledge I have with my limited experience on our continent, to propose to you a few ideas to help us think together about the future of our continent beyond today. In preparing myself for this engagement, honorable members, I tried to, pray, to peruse through future studies and scenarios that have been developed and are available on our internet and our libraries. Almost many of them, almost many of them were undertaken before our encounter with COVID-19, and very few of them ever predicted that humanity would be hit by a pandemic of this magnitude. Honorable members, from where I stand, I can see five future trends that should be of great concern to us as a continent. And these are one, technology, two, the new Cold War, three, the space age, four, what I call the butterfly effect factors, and then finally, fifthly, what I call the people dynamic. Technology has had a transformative effect on humans since the prehistoric times when our ancestors discovered fire. And it will continue to do so into the near and long-term future. The question is, however, the role and place of Africa in these technological developments. We are taught in school that humans have undergone four major technological revolutions, beginning with the first one that occurred in Great Britain towards the end of the 18th century. During this first industrial revolution of textile machines, Africa's contribution was as a source of slave labor and colonies for their raw materials and riches. These were the formative years of what has become known in wealth system theory as the development of underdevelopment, when the underdevelopment of our countries began. During the second industrial revolution, of the 19th century, end of the 19th century into the early 20th century. This one of the Fordism with his cars and the period of gas and oil. Most of Africa was still under colonial rule, under the yoke of colonial oppression and subjected to super exploitation of our human and natural resources. The third industrial revolution of electronics and computers occurred during our lifetime in the 1970s. Here, most of Africa, except for a few of us in Southern Africa, was now an independent continent with the earthwhile organization of African unity already in place. But during this transformative te technological wave, we were just users and admirers of computers. We are now in the midst of what we believe to be the fourth industrial revolution, the era of internet of things, big data, artificial intelligence, and the looming metaverse. Even here as we speak, 
Africa is just a dependent user and an overzealous consumer of this new technology. And we are about to, we are not about to be a big player as inventors and producers in this new wave called the fourth industrial revolution. Our attitude and approach is to consume more and more and possess more and more of these technologies. By contrast, in other regions of the world, in other countries across the world, the approach is to set up established top end technology centers to generate own technology patents, own machines, own inventions, not just consume, just use what others have invented for us. And by the way, some of these inventors whose technologies have taken over our lives, like Facebook, were just mere kids when they came up with their inventions. For an entire continent like ours, none of us is yet to match this kid and come up with an invention that will disrupt and transform our daily lives. I do not want to be misunderstood, honorable members, to be misunderstood, to be discounting or dismissing the historical, political, economic context uh, to constraints facing our continent. But I'm no longer prepared to continue looking at myself always as a victim. Honorable members, the new Cold War is upon us. Just a few months ago, none of us would have thought that the new Cold War will happen so soon like the previous one of the 1950s to the end of the 1990s. If we are not careful, our continent will become a zone for bloody proxy wars and we will be forced to choose sides. My enemy's enemy should become my enemy. In the past, during the previous Cold War, Africa's response was divided between choosing sides and the non-alignment of the non-aligned movement. We have to find an answer to this question as individual countries and collectively as the African Union. Are we going to choose sides like we did before, or are we going to have to, add to, to opt for nine alignment? And if so, how different should this nine alignment be? Honorable members, I believe that the 21st century will enter history as a space age. I define the space age as a period when planet Earth, our terrestrial base, will be merged into one spatial continuum with our immediate outer space at least at the outer space within our solar systems. Humans will soon settle on Mars, planet Mars. They will soon colonize celestial bodies like the satellites we have around us, like our moon, the satellite like the moon, which is a satellite to our planet. Thinking back to the 15th century, that is how the Western part of Europe came to conquer and dominate our planet to this day. When those Europeans reached what became known as the Americas, and others rounded the Cape in search of a way to the East, Europe was not different from the rest of us. But since then, from those conquests and the colonization that followed of the world, slave trade and so forth, Europe transformed itself into a center of our universe to become our economic and knowledge hub. Over to all of us while underdeveloping the rest of us. The same is about to happen the next gold rush will not be to colonies across oceans or across the seas, but the rush to the lands in the outer space. The African Union has Agenda 2063, the chairperson has already said it, with a set of flagship projects, among which uh, flagship projects which are intended to serve as accelerators, among which is what is called Africa Outer Space Strategy. And the AU says, and I wish to quote, the Africa Outer Space Strategy aims to strengthen Africa's use of outer space to bolster its development. Outer space is of critical importance to the development of Africa in all fields, agriculture, disaster management, remote sensing, climate focus, banking and finance, as well as defense and security. Africa's access to space technology products is no longer a matter of luxury, and there is a need to speed up access to these technologies and products. New developments in satellite technologies make these accessible to African countries and appropriate policies and strategies are required to develop a regional market for space products in Africa, close quote. Honorable members, you can see from this quote, from this thinking, that our orientation as Africa and our level of ambition is quite timid and largely terrestrial. For me, the transformative aspect of space technology is in, is in enabling humans to occupy other planets, to turn them into our alternative home, and to encounter other civilizations and intelligent spaces that are beyond our planet. 
Those who will be there settling on those lands will be the winners of the 21st century. And Africans won't be there and won't be among them unless we do something different, beginning with changing our unambitious mindset about outer space and space technology. If I, I, am, I happen to be a South African, but if I were in a position to suggest, South Africa need to consider three actions in this area. First, we have a South African uh, space agency is to move this into the presidency like it's practiced in many countries, actually in many, many countries where there is advancement in space technology and uh, sending uh, shuttles. Space technology is linked or directly in the, under the presidency. Secondly, we need to strategize to establish a strategic consortium of key stakeholders, key sectors, key actors in this sector. That is the politicians, the decision makers, the research and academic community, the industry technology experts, and it's for them to constitute a community. And then finally, we, read, we need to reach out to global partners to train Africans in areas where we have no capability so that we can produce, like other regions, African astronauts to join their colleagues for research out there in the interspace, like a lot of it now happens in the International Space Station. The Chinese are also establishing their International Space Station very soon. Honorable members, the butterfly effect factors, it's, uh, of course, it's a concept that comes from uh, chaos theory. It refers to a phenomenon where a butterfly just flips its wing somewhere far away, and then the effects of that culminate in something kind of catastrophic for humanity. This is really, uh, and here I'm thinking of uh, pandemics, COVID-19 itself is just a small virus, and we don't know where it comes from, maybe it comes from an animal, it came into humans, just a small insignificant occurrence, then it results in this pandemic effect upon humans. Climate change also has that butterfly effect um, possibilities out for us. Therefore, we have to prepare ourselves for better. We have to learn from what has just happened. And two lessons have to be learned from COVID-19. The first one is that we need to rethink, and we, have all, we are already doing it, to rethink our concept of disaster. Up to now, our concept of disaster within the UN framework, within the African Union framework, was limited to fire, to floods. When we're thinking of national disaster, we're thinking not of the butterfly effect, but things that humans can manage. Maybe they could disrupt communities, move like floods and so on, but not really the way uh, COVID-19 has done. And then the second thing, of course, we have to proactively build state resilience in our countries for our countries to be able to withstand external and unexpected shocks. Finally, the fifth future trend is what I, I call in this presentation, the people dynamic. It's about our livelihoods, the cohabitation, and issues of prosperity of humans as a species. And here are some of the issues that I think are very important, which will really affect us, and I won't go to each one of them. It's issues of international migration and migration within countries, the demographic explosion. We know that Africa is one of the fastest growing region in terms of population and how the impact of this on our environment, on our sustainability, the youth factor, which is unemployment, opportunities for the youth, the pressure on our social system, education, health, and so on and so on. The issue of diversity management, the issue of religion, cohabitation among people. Uh, uh, the, the, the national chairperson was talking about uh, inter, uh, African migrants in South Africa. We can also think of ethnicity, religion, and issues of diversity management, which in, in a number of instances, they lead and result to wars, conflicts, and significant and differences. And then finally, issues of food, water, and energy security. So this is really a cluster of issues which I put under the category I call the people dynamic. And China has shown recently, and it's just an example, Excellencies, that um, poverty, abject poverty can be eradicated. And it's something that should be an inspiration to us as an African. And I was in another country now in Southern Africa. The, one of the effects of COVID is for the country's mindset to change. They used to import wheat and maize. Now they are going full scale now to try to utilize their land to, to cultivate maize. They were telling me that, for example, they are, the maize from their own land domestically, it's even less than, it's in the 3% range, it's very, very low, as well as, as, well as, uh, as, well as wheat. No, the wheat is in the region of 3%. Maize is also less, but a bit higher. So they are now expanding production. So this is one positive comes, coming out of COVID. And then, of course, another country was subjected to, to sanctions, and then the country uh, found itself without food. Without, and then the response of the country uh, and the leadership of the country was to, 
to, to, look, to look towards their, their land and to produce. And the country now is one of the base cases that we are now as APRM looking at for, for food security, example of food security, achievement of food security on our continent. And of course, we have a big issue of malaria in South um, in, in Africa. I'm now in Central Africa, we're going to at the meeting of the African Union. And everywhere we go, we have to always take precautions, malaria, malaria. But this is also embarrassing for our continent because for other countries in the world, malaria has been eradicated. There's technology, there's medication, there are means to eradicate malaria. But in Africa, it's still something that we live with and it's causing unnecessary human life. Honorable members, we need to action, and therefore, in response to these uh, uh, trends that I've, I, I've suggested for our discussion, we need to action two transformative interventions if Africa is to respond adequately to this future trend and to emerge better as a continent. And the first one is to transform the African Union, and this has already started. And then the second one, of course, is to transform the African state. In terms of the reforms of the African Union, you know that the, the, reform, the African Union has been undergoing the reforms over the last uh, few years or so, and uh, these reforms are identified with Excellency, His Excellency President Porka Kama, President of the Republic of, of Rwanda, and then the core reform priorities, which of course were endorsed by the Assembly of the African Union, they focus on key priorities uh, of continental scope, the realignment of African Union institutions in order to deliver against priorities, connecting the African Union to its citizens, managing the business of the African Union efficiently and effectively at both the political and operational levels. And then of course, financing the African Union sustainably with the full ownership of our member states. What did, what, when international relations, international organizations reform themselves, they want to achieve quite a number of things. And I'll quickly just list them. One is that to revisit the, vote, the vision and goal setting elements and how to get there or achieve their goal. The legal issues relating to improving existing legal frameworks, the institutional elements creating new institutions or transforming existing ones, and then issues around the technical competence, improving the competency of the secretariats or commissions uh, uh, for program execution, budgets, etc., improving the working methods, harmonization, alignment, and integration of the re relevant bodies within the within the, the entity. The UN has done that quite a lot to establish what they call the UN union-wide system, and participation, that is participation of uh, member states and participation of non-state uh, non actors in the system, and then and the issues of sustainability and self-financing, and then finally the role of this uh, international ent of this entity in the global, in the global field. For us, I need to point out that the reforms that have happened quite recently, over the last few years, is not for the first time that the AU has undergone such reforms. The first major phase of reforms, it was when the African leaders themselves in the 1960s were thinking about what to do with independence and what to, how they must, and then the idea at that time was to set up the United States of Africa. Kwame Nkrumah, our chairperson has just cited, reminded us from uh, uh, citing from Africa Must Unite, a 1963 publication by Kwame Nkrumah of how the leaders were thinking about, but it was a debate. So you could call that the formative years, which were in the 1960s. I call it the founders period, which was largely ideological in its focus. Then in the 1970s, then there were attempts to review and revisit the OAU charter. And this continued well into the, into the 1990s when, the, when we established out of that process what became known as the African Economic Community. Then there is also an era, and then here in my presentation, I, I call it the era, of, the era of plans without champions. This is the period between the 1970s, 1980s or so, and these periods we produced two major plans. The first one was the Lagos Plan of Action, which was adopted in 1980, but it started quite earlier from Monrovia. And then the, when later in the 1990s, we then developed the Lagos Plan of Action into what became known as the Abuja Treaty. So this was more like a roadmap towards the establishment of the African economic community. But it, the reason I call it the era of, of plans without champions, because it was not championed by, these were not championed by African leaders themselves. They were the work largely of the Economic Commission of Africa, which at that time was led by Professor Adibayo Adjahid, our Nigerian who's just uh, passed on. Then we had a period of transition. This is the transition, and this is the period I call the era of champions. This is the period of the transition from the OAU 
to the African Union. So this is the end, at the beginning with the, at the end of the Cold War, in the end of the 1990s into the 2000s. This is the beginning, in our case, as South Africa here, with the period we associate with our former president, President Tabumbeki. This is the period, the period during which, as the African Union or the OAU African Union, we outlawed military coups through the rejection of unconstitutional change of government. It began in Algiers in 1999. It was then codified into a code by the African Union at the summit of the OAU in Rome. Then we also adopted what I call the Trinity of the relationship among three, that Africa has to address these three challenges, development, governance, and peace and security. That this Trinity of challenges is at the core of our difficulties. And this was established during that period, this Trinity. And then, of course, there's a period also out of this recognition of this Trinity, acceptance of this Trinity to say we must again deal with it. Then we gave birth to the new Partnership for Africa's Development, NEPAT, and then where the organization where I went to today, the African Peer Review Mechanism, which was intended to be a vehicle to deal with the, the governance component to this Trinity. NEPAT was intended to deal with the development uh, challenge to, 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 to this Trinity. And out of it, of course, we also later uh, gave birth to two, what we now call them architectures in the African Union. One architecture is the African Peace and Security Architecture, which has the Peace and Security Council and associated bodies. This one deals with the third part of the Trinity, deals with peace and security around mediation, response to conflict, and so on, and intervention. And then, of course, the APRM is part of what is now called the African Governance Architecture, where we have all these organs dealing with uh, governance-related issues, the courts, and so on and so on, under the AGA platform. And these have now emerged over the last few years uh, since uh, the uh, post the transition period. And then, of course, out of this, then we came up with what is now called the African Union Shared Values. So this is a body of ideas around good governance, uh, working for a prosperous Africa, constitutionalism, human rights, promotion, and so on and so on. And then also as part of that, it was the entrenchment of what is now being entrenched, at least in theory, as the principle of African ownership of our problem and African leadership in the determination of our destiny. And during that period, we had the, the, the and this was the period of uh, also when Colonel Gaddafi was still alive, he led what became known as the Union Government Debate, where he wanted immediately to establish the United States of Africa. And this was a really heated ideological debate. It was about the approach and the model that we should adopt and the speed at which we should uh, move towards the establishment of the United States of Africa uh, on our continent. And then, of course, we conducted the, over the audit of the African Union. And then we also, during that period, explored alternative methods of self-financing, which was led initially by President Omar Sanju. And, 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 and all of these things, then they culminate in the current wave, or how we could say, current phase of reforms, which are now being associated with the President of, of Rwanda. So, honorable members, what were the achievements, roughly, from this uh, uh, you could say this reforms from this uh, period. The first one was ideological, and let's not take it for granted. Pan Africanism. Pan Africanism is a big achievement that we have registered so far. One of the big achievements we have registered. And I say this because such kind of a pan ideology, pan, pan identity is not easy in other regions. And I can say proudly so as an African, that is probably in Africa where you have this kind of a pen, a very strong sense of pen, pen solidarity. And the union government debate and other debates reinforced this uh, pen identity. And we are celebrating uh, the Pan -Africa, African Union Day today, the Africa Day in the United States uh, and the America, they have what they call uh, 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 Pan Africanism Day, I think it's in April, 14th of April, but it's highly contested with debates among themselves. When should it happen? Should it be on Columbus Day? Others do it as a reaction and so on and so on. But on the continent, there's, there's, there's consensus on the core elements of Pan Africanism. So we should not take it for granted. We also have established it, the uh, now entrenched, really, this messianic concept of African Renaissance. I call it messianic because it's about this idea of Africa as a sleeping giant that is about to rise and claim its rightful place in history. And this, uh, we, of course, we identified with President Becky here when you talk in South Africa, but it has a long history. 
It actually began in the 19th century in the African diaspora, mainly in North America, among the African Americans. And the, it's among its progenitors. I, uh, one was uh, Alexander Cromwell, and then Martin Delaney also was one of his progenitors. And of course, it, it was popularized and brought into the continent much more forcefully by Edward Blyden. And at the time, they were not really calling it African Renaissance, they were calling it the regeneration of Africa. And this concept, you know, it was made uh, uh, popularized among South Africa by the 1906 lecture by our own South African uh, uh, Pixley Kassene. But Pixley Kassene was just uh, giving a lecture, powerful as it is, but he was influenced by ideas that had already been in circulation in the African-American cycles, um, at least from the 1850s uh, and so on by, 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 by Alexander Cromwell. Alexander Cromwell himself, he gave a sermon on the same topic, the regeneration of Africa. Then we had in the 1930s, uh, one of the major uh, reflection on this topic in the 1930s was President uh, uh, Dr. Azekio, who become Nigeria's first president, he wrote a book, Renaissance Africa. And then after independence, this whole idea took various and different mutations. We don't have time to go into all of it. You know that Kwame Nkrumah developed his own concept of conscientiousism. Uh, Julius Nyerere was talking of Ujamaa as a form of African socialism. Then there were elements of negritude, which began quite earlier in the 20s and the 1930s. But of course, they grew associated with, uh, with Senghor in, in, in Senegal around the negritude movement. Then there were also of course, uh, Kenneth Kaunda spoke of what he called himself African humanism. So there were all these ideas of this Africa that is about to rise, that should rise. How, how do we do it? How It's like you're waiting for the return of a continent that used to be glorious, some sort of a messianic element to it. And of course, and to come and save our continent. And of course, the, the among the African intelligence here, similar trends were, were, uh, were, were occurring in the parallel. Of course, we have Sheikh Hanta Duke himself. He published a series of papers on the topic African Renaissance, the Senegalese. Samir Amin, he developed the concept of delinking as his suggestion of how Africa could, could achieve its rise and its, uh, its emergence. And Alizam Alima Zui spoke about the triple heritage and all of them. So we, there's no time to go into, into that strain of work. And then, of course, in the, nine, in the 2000, during the transition phase, the, the, I referred to earlier, then we see the period of Mbekis, and the, the, it was a, a period where they talk about the emergence of a new core of leadership. And then that's when then President Beggy gave me famous 1996 uh, lecture in Parliament on the African Renaissance. And now, subsequent in recent years, we have seen now the emergence of what became known as Africa Rising. And this one came largely from the private sector, which were identifying Africa as an emerging economic frontier opportunities and supported by, by, by some international agencies to try to, to view Africa as an emerging economic front, an emerging economic opportunity. But this was to be short-lived. And of course, on the AU front, it was overshadowed by the Agenda 2063, adoption of Agenda 2063 in 2013, which changed the whole narrative around Africa rising. And of course, now with COVID-19, COVID-19 represents you could say, a counter-narrative, a demoralizing narrative about the African potential for our continent. So this is really the things that we have achieved ideologically, Pan-Africanism, and then this Mycenaic notion of African Renaissance. But in addition to that, honorable, we have created all these institutions, and let's not take it lightly, because other regions can't. I think after us, it's probably only the European Union that is able to establish all these institutions, the OAU, the AU, the organ, the regional economic committees. The regional economic programs that we have, Agenda 2060, the legal instrument, the Constitutive Act, and then, of course, the debates, limited as they, have, as they are on self-financing options for the African continent. These are important achievements we should not, under, we should not undermine. And, of course, issues of participation, the participation of our member states, how they should participate, the relationship between the member states and the continental bodies, and the participation of our own people in the African Union. And then, of course, our relations with the, with the external world, and we have developed various uh, uh, mechanisms, one of which is, of course, what you call the partnerships. Uh, partnerships uh, where Africa has this partnership with China, OCAC, TICAD, 
with the EU and so on and so on, where these are established mechanisms for Africa to engage globally. Within the UN, we have the Africa A3 and how the Africa A3, the Africa, and then the African group, how it works. And then also we try to build consensus on deployment of Africans in international organizations. So when there are positions in the international system, we go to the African Union to, to, to uh, uh, subcommittees that deals with candidatures, we submit there and then get consensus for Africa around those candidates. And then Africa, then we lobby as one in the international space for, for our, own our, our own candidates. I'm saying we shouldn't undermine this as achievement because other regions are able to do what we do. Then the next step, honorable members, when it comes to reforms, and this is really an, an issue that is we, 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 it, it, worth considering as we think through these issues as Africans, is, is, is to reform the reforms themselves. And reform the reforms themselves by institutionalizing the reforms. They should not depend on great individuals because many of them are out there. President Kagame is one of them. But such individuals are rare in history and will not always be there. So you need an institutional mechanism that will be able to sustain the reforms, even in the absence of great leaders, that the system itself will be able to go and to carry us through and so on. And one of the ways to do this is that every four years, the EU, they do it, and I think it's something we should copy. Every four years before the election of a new commission, to convene an African popular multi-stakeholder African assembly where we look at various uh, aspects of, of our state of our integration, where things are we're not working, where things are, what needs to be reformed. So in the EU, they do it, and it's, it's quite a powerful tool for reforms, and they use it to, for institutionalization of reform, and I think it's something that worth considering as African. Then the second transformative intervention is one relating to the transformation of the African state. And then, of course, here, of the three, the core, or the, you say the trinity elements I referred to earlier, of peace and security, development, and governance. Governance is the most difficult of the three, of, among the three. And it's so difficult for two reasons. The first reason is because of the triple significance that governance has to the African condition, or triple importance that governance has to the African condition. First is governance as a root cause to our problems. Governance accounts for the existence of the other two challenges. The absence of government, governance, we see it in development challenges. Um, peace and security is a manifestation of our failures in the area of governance. Governance is also a bottleneck. Governance is a bottleneck. The absence or lack of good governance becomes a stumbling block to moving Africa forward. And then finally, governance as an enabler the presence or existence of good governance making or makes the forward, the forward movement of Africa in a number of areas possible. The second reason why governance is so difficult and the most difficult among the three in the Trinity challenges emanates from our own thinking or our own thoughts or our own idea, or in fact, in the nature of the state, the multidimensional nature of the state. And the state has three elements to it and in my, in my proposal. The first one, it has the institutional form. So these are the institutions, government itself, uh, the bureaucracy, uh, you could also say the legislative element to these are institutional elements. To it. Then it has what one could call the aspirational dimension. So humans create the state for a reason, the same way that the serial killer's evil deeds will be driven by a moral cause. Even dictatorial regimes have aspirations and intended purpose by their creators. These aspirations are expressed through our political ideas, the laws we pass, even the brutality we inflict on others, etc. And then finally, and probably the most difficult part of the governance dimension to the government to three dimensions of governance is the personal, the warm body, the personal ambition of people, personalities. Some of us are very moody, and we take this personality with us when we become leaders. We can't separate ourselves from it. It's impossible. Some of us like money, some don't. Some find it genuinely difficult to step down from the chair when the time has come as a function of their personality. We encounter such personality, not just in government, big leaders. No, we also encounter such personalities, even in churches or in small organizations, like Stockfells 
or a soccer club. The APRM, in the APRM, we attempt to approach the challenge of governance informed by this multidimensional approach. So we propose interventions in the five areas that we work on as the APRM. We propose uh, uh, interventions in the five areas, touching on the institutional and aspirational dimensions of the state, because the state is created by humans with certain aspirations to oppress, to liberate, to feed, to do this, and so on and so on. But then so, the peer part of our work, that's why we are called the African Peer Review Mechanism, is related to leaders as persons, as human beings, for leaders to give each other food feedback on their performance and the service to their people. In conclusion, Madam Chair, in summary, I believe that uh, in summary, really the key things for us as a continent in the post-pandemic period, of course, is peace and security, the silencing of the guns, we have revised the time frames, and, uh, and this time I'm not sure, I know we, we have, we said uh, uh, silencing the guns by 2020, it has passed. Now we have revised the time frame. So we really, it's a big issue. The governance contestations are still there and are, are, are real over elections, over the constitution. And of course, the one issues that are arising out of the unconstitutional change of government. I'm now in Malabo for the African Union Summit on exactly this topic. What different must we do to make sure that we, we build on what was achieved in Algiers in Lome to make sure that we put an end to this current wave of unconstitutional change of government, but also at the same time, we prevent the ones likely to happen in the future. And of course, moving the reforms to the next stage. And as I argue that the reforms have to move to a stage now where we are able to institutionalize them, that they can occur even when there's no great leader among our leaders, because it's natural, it happens that way. There will be a time when we don't have many great leaders. And so what happens at that time? So we have to institutionalize the reform so that they occur and they take place in a certain way at certain intervals, so that then as a continent, we're able to advance and move towards our goal of building the United States of Africa. And then the development questions are there and they remain adequately, adequately answered. On the infrastructure Africa, we've been talking about Cape to Cairo, even up to now, we are yet to build an inch. I'm told that the Egyptians, of course, they have some ideas around that here on the South African side, it's still difficult. So infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure is our biggest challenge. And of course, we have now managed to launch this, the African continental free trade, but now our colleagues are negotiating it, operationalizing it, and it's going to be a long, uh, 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 it's not going to be an easy journey moving forward. And then the issues around climate change as a, as a butterfly effect and how we must be dealing with it because it's one small thing that uh, just a small thing because of certain uh, conditions prevailing in our environment, a small uh, a rain could result like we saw in Derek, in a massive flood that wipes out uh, communities. Uh, this is the butterfly effect. And of course, the socioeconomic agenda as articulated in Agenda 2063 and Agenda 2030 of the United, of the United Nations. And then of course, we're going to have to think and think seriously as Africans about the role of our continent in the world post this conflict that's happening there in in, in, in in Ukraine. Madam moderator, they say, when you show the moon to a child, it sees only a finger. I hope I have not become that child today, only pointing out to Africa's problem. My intention was to also suggest some next steps. I hope I was able to help in that regard. I thank you very much. I don't know how we can upload <laughs> to the presentation. But thank you very much, Professor. I think the Chief Whip, as he's sitting there, is already thinking about how we are going to follow up on this presentation. I know my Chief Whip, and I know he's already thinking on how we need to follow up on this presentation. It is so enlightening. I was even looking at my speech that I must open the debate later, and I was thinking, can't I just ask you to send me your notes? Because <laughs> this is so informative and it is so enlightening. I'm sure all the members and even the public that are watching agrees with me on that score. But we have to continue with the program. Thank you once again. I'm sure the Chief Whip will also express his gratitude of the, of the Council when we continue. We will now call on the Deputy Minister of International Relations, 
my comrade, my uh, colleague, and my friend, Honorable Alvin Botes, for the first commentary. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, moderator, the deputy chair of NCOP, uh, Mam Lucas, uh, chairperson of NCOP, Honorable Masundo, Professor Eddie Malogo, um, uh, eminent African scholar and CEO of APRM. Um, I have also noticed that we have with us uh, uh, an eminent uh, persona in international relations, uh, Ambassador Dango. Uh, let me acknowledge also uh, Honorable Mohai, the, the, the chief of, of the NCOP. Uh, Shepherdson, I stand on the established protocols. Uh, uh, my, my inception uh, point will be, um, I think what is key and critical, uh, when we look at Africa um, and when we look at ourselves, um, you would be able to see one of two things, uh, Honorable Chair. You, you'll see a, a glass that is uh, half, half full or you see a glass that is half empty. Evidently, where you stand uh, in terms of that type of a lens, um, it's because of your orientation. Um, and the orientation, comrades, when we speak about the African agenda, I think there should be an appreciation that uh, there was in Africa, um, uh, what we call the forebears of the uh, liberation struggle, and in particular, Pan-Africanism, um, amongst, amongst the key people, uh, Julius Nerere, Sam Samora Moshe, Jomo Kenyatta, Senor Jomo, uh, Haile Selassie, uh, uh, Abdel Nassar, who together with uh, Kwame Krum was uh, two African uh, heads of uh, two African leaders um, that have co-founded actually the uh, non-aligned movement. And I think we, we should be grateful uh, for their foresight uh, in terms of uh, deepening pan-Africanism, uh, Chairperson, because their ideological orientation, of course, uh, negated uh, the, the stronghold of uh, uh, imperialism in Africa, in particular, the outcomes of the 1884 Berlin uh, Conference, uh, which was obviously convened uh, or co-convened by King Leopold uh, of, um, of, of Belgium. Um, and, and I'm raising it because what we, must, what we must at all times be careful about, comrades, is to uh, agree to, to memory lapses as it relates to uh, how Africa involved and what was the uh, uh, historical pitfalls as it relates to Africa's prosperity. So substantively, I think my submission in line with what Comrade, uh, or, or my apologies, Professor Eri Maloko have said, uh, I think the, the OAU uh, and her establishment in 1963 have substantively executed its mandate. And one of its mandates was to cultivate maximum unity amongst African uh, leadership uh, as a way to advance the decolonial struggle. Um, at the point when the OAU's mandate uh, came to an end, um, we were left uh, only with two uh, colonial states uh, that we had to uh, engage on, and that was the plight, obviously, as it relates to um, uh, Western Sahara, uh, and obviously the plight of the people of uh, South Sudan. So substantively, the OEU obviously have been able to reach uh, its uh, 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 agenda. Of course, Che, what we must uh, submit is there has been challenges as it relates to unity, uh, you know, um, in Africa amongst, uh, pr uh, you know, your prominent African uh, leadership, even during the time of the OAU, where we had uh, the Brazzaville groups, Casablanca uh, powers, uh, even today we speak about Anglophone and, and Francophone, etc. And that is an antithesis to 
the, the novel ideals of both the OAU and the African Union, which speaks about uh, a, a need for maximum uh, unity amongst the African people and African Renaissance. So that is our singular uh, identity when we speak about uh, what is African identity and what needs to be done, obviously, Chair, to be able to ensure that we reach uh, the nobility of uh, 2063, which is our common African agenda that speaks about what we want, what we envisage uh, as it relates to inclusive prosperity. I thought the important issue that we must reflect on today, Chairperson, is um, maybe uh, when we speak about inclusive prosperity, um, I, I thought I must, uh, it must be prefaced with a problem statement. If the problem statement uh, in the form and the extent, Chairperson, is that the African continent it provides uh, basically 12% of the world uh, oil reserves, 10% uh, approximately of uh, natural uh, gas, 80% uh, of world uh, platinum, 40% of its diamonds, 25% uh, of its gold, and 27% of cobalt. Uh, the problem detail, Chair, in that statement uh, is that ironically, being a continent that is so vast, um, vast in terms of its uh, depth of its resources, Africa generally we rank low in terms of our human development index, global infrastructure index, um, a, a global peace uh, index, and corruption index, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. As a way of responding, responding to that problem statement, the, the AU then chair detailed what they called seven uh, aspirations uh, for the achievement of that inclusive prosperity of Africa and uh, 15 flagship uh, programs. Obviously, Chairperson, if you look at the aspiration one of the African Union, uh, it speaks about a the idealistic uh, aspiration of striving for inclusive uh, prosperity and sustained economic uh, development. And what we have done as member states of the AU is to obviously look at the Abuja Treaty as it relates to economic integration of Africa. And we have then pivoted the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, Comrades, as it relates to that aspiration uh, one. I think that as a flagship, as one of the 15 flagship programs of the African Union, it has allowed Africa to leapfrog. Where we are, comrades, evidently, it's, uh, I think we are standing at 90% as it relates to tariff uh, uh, negotiations uh, in terms of uh, making sure the free trade agreement um, is implemented at a rapid level. Out of the 55 uh, uh, states in Africa that is recognized by the African Union, uh, we, we have seen 54 actually have uh, signed uh, on to the treaty. And uh, obviously, I think Eritrea is still outstanding in terms of its internal uh, consultative mechanism. But what we have seen, Chair, is 41 actually have ratified. It means it have all gone the full circle in terms of uh, ensuring there is a parliamentary um, uh, 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 embracement as it relates to the continental free trade agreement. I wish to make an important point, Chair, how the type of foresight uh, the, 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 the authors uh, has actually brought forward for us um, in relation to our own economic figures. We, we had seen for the very first time, uh, uh, Comrade uh, uh, Moderator, Honorable Chair, that in 2021, um, exports uh, to the, the African Union um, uh, member states uh, uh, stood at uh, uh, 385 uh, billion rand, as opposed to uh, export to uh, member states of the, the, the European Union, uh, where it stood at 355 uh, billion rand. So evidently what comrades can already see is that the, 
the South African economic uh, fortunes um, is rapidly changing uh, as it relates to how we see ourselves as it relates to intra-Africa trade. And that, I think, it's a it's an important point uh, that we that we are making, Jack. The second aspiration, uh, comrades, in terms of the AU, uh, speaks about our ambition to be politically united um, uh, and to advance the ideals of uh, pan-Africanism. Now, I've, I have a particular disclaimer, Professor Morocco, uh, because where you have said, uh, I think there's common ground as it relates to the unity of the African leaders uh, today. Um, uh, and my disclaimer is obviously, uh, we are faced with the fact that Pan-Africanism, what it has actually meant for the forebears of the OAU, necessarily, comrades, um, is on a collusion course as it relates to its relationship to, uh, to national interests of member states of the African Union. And I'm raising this issue as a very important uh, point, comrades, because there has been in uh, the contemporary IR uh, landscape very big debates about the fact that uh, there has been a readmission of, 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 of Morocco into the African Union, uh, as opposed to uh, the attitude of the forebears of the AU in the form of the OAU. Um, and subsequently, we have seen um, a decision by the African Union uh, Commission uh, Chairperson uh, Musa Falki to actually accord a a critical uh, uh, space uh, of opinion in the form of uh, allocating observer status um, you know, to the state of Israel uh, 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 in the AU. Um, and I'm saying that my disclaimer is that at which stage, comrades, do we dilute the significance of making sure there is a completion as it relates to the decolonial process in Africa is concerned? whilst we are having a kingdom in the form of Morocco uh, that are subverting increasingly UN, United Nations, United Nations uh, General Assembly resolutions around the self-determination of the people of Western Sahara. And I think that is my disclaimer that I thought uh, we must be able to put forward. But importantly, comrades, I hope comrades will appreciate that that discussion should be taken place in relation to what we call national interests of member states or of other, other African uh, 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 nations. The third issue, comrades, speaks about the, the aspirations as it relates to good governance in Africa, respect for human uh, rights and the rule of law. And I must commend the APRM and the stewardship and tutelage of Professor Eri Maloko for what he has done, comrades, uh, in the form of not only having APRM as a voluntary, self-critical vehicle uh, and, a, and, a, and a voluntary, self-critical reflection uh, of African states, but it's also to have ensure and canvas the African Union for the expansion of the role of the APRM. For example, comrades would know that you have your credit rating agents such as Moody's, uh, etc. And there has never been a dialectical relationship between what Moody uh, is doing as a credit rating agency in Africa, vice versa, the substantive qualitative work done by the IPRM. And there is now a, a citation made by the African Union through the APRM that ordinarily uh, there should be a, a, re a relationship of mutual benefit as it relates to what is the optics of governance and a number of other key indices which credit rating agencies looks at Africa, vice versa, the optics as it relates to what the APRM themselves have been able to observe. So I think there is a qualitative uh, matter as it relates to that issue is concerned. Comrades, what I know that uh, when we speak about the rule of law, there is matters as it relates to the ICC or International Criminal Court normally that comes to the fore. But I want to indicate to comrades here that our experience at the level of the government 
is that your ICC have a very, very significant and a comprehensive role uh, as it relates to uh, making sure, for example, the social justice, uh, in not only in Africa, but in the rest of the world. The pivotal role, for example, ICC, uh, the posture, the attitude and composure as it relates to uh, you know, the plight of the, of, of, of the Palestine people, as it relates to the, the plight of the people of Venezuela, in relation to, as it relates to Venezuela, unilateral sanction, and in terms of the Palestine uh, uh, issue, as it relates to criminal conduct uh, from uh, the, the state of Israel. I think it's, it, it's a key imperative uh, that we should actually uh, appreciate Congress when we speak about uh, the role of ICC as it relates to uh, rule or rule of law. The, the fourth issue, comrades, uh, normally they say uh, this is the elephant in the room, is the matter as of the aspiration for uh, that speaks about, uh, you know, uh, having a, securing a, 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 a peaceful continent. Um, uh, we know that during the chairpersonship of President uh, Ramaphosa, in 2020, um, the cessation of hostilities became a key thematic approach, which fortunately, uh, colleagues, has resulted in a declaration from the African Union that this decade, uh, 2020 up until 2023, uh, coincide with a heightened focus to make sure we bring about cessation of hostilities. Cessation of hostilities, uh, 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 you know, and having a secured uh, uh, Africa, obviously have two legs. The first leg is about what we call the unfortunate uh, uh, appetite as it relates to prolonging the lifespan of uh, uh, democratically elected leaders in Africa, um, where you have, after you have served a particular term, there is an appetite of course, then to extend uh, the term to what we call your third, uh, third term as type of uh, ambition. Um, and what we are saying, uh, comrades, is that we, we think and we suggest that it's a key and important issue that the Pan-African uh, Parliament obviously needs to look at as it relates to the overarching uh, structure of the African state and, and at the substantive level. Then we have what we call your uh, forceful, your military dictatorship in Africa, uh, where there's a forceful overthrow of uh, democratically elected uh, leadership under the auspices normally that will bring about interim uh, peace and security, and then will prepare for a democratic election. We, we, we think those are issues that we need to continue to be seized with comrades. Uh, there is obviously a component as it relates to what we call political economy uh, that is prevalent, that is present, where you have outside forces, uh, both state and non-state actors, that are deeply involved uh, in fueling conflict in Africa. For example, comrades know that uh, there's an old age um, uh, conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the DRC, uh, where South Africa obviously is a key uh, member of the force interrogation intervention brigade, uh, you know, under the auspices uh, and as affirmed by the by the United Nations, uh, the issues of the cobalt we have raised it earlier on, where we have said that we have a significant amount of cobalt, which is the mineral that actually makes sure that your iPads, uh, your tablets, uh, iPhones, Samsung, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are able to function. And that is a key uh, factor in terms of us not bringing about cessation of hostilities uh, within, uh, within the, the, the east of the DRC, especially your North Kivi uh, Goma area. The second issue where we have seen it with the discovery of your liquid fuel, fuel uh, gas deposits in Capital Gado in the north of Mozambique. Uh, when there was no discovery of this natural gas, uh, colleagues, th there has not been a crisis. Suddenly, there was a heightening of uh, conflict, which obviously has been as a result of a of a uh, um, uh, 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 Islamic type of uh, uh, force that have actually uh, tried to uh, make sure there's an instability, especially 
in terms of your your capital cargo, which obviously I think the US have, have classified that force as uh, um, uh, uh, you know being a, a distance cousin of ISIS. So those are the challenges that we that we are faced with. And the, the fourth aspiration, uh, uh, moderator. It's obviously, uh, you know, the self-introspection as it relates to whether in Africa there's a shared value system, shared belief. Do we recognize there's a common heritage with strong cultural identification? And I think uh, for, uh, what Professor Monoko, what we, I think we need to be seized with is this matter as it relates to, uh, for an example, um, in Zimbabwe, there's a problem as it relates to um, economic fortunes is concerned. That problem has, as a result of unilateral sanctions uh, precipitated by the UK and uh, the US, amongst other, uh, uh, against key economic sectors in, in Zimbabwe. That sanctions does not take into consideration. There was a GPA that was concluded to ensure the issues, for example, about the land question in Zimbabwe under the tutelage that time of President Mbeki gets resolved. There was a reluctance of the key uh, uh, stakeholder to implement um, the, the, the necessary financial uh, uh, funding to uh, make sure that the key tenants of the agreements are sustained. Now that there is this unilateral sanctions, the, the, there's a homogene of the economic uh, of the economy of Zimbabwe. We are then unfortunately seen as a more uh, uh, prosperous destination. You then have what we call your irregular human movement uh, that results in a particular attitude from uh, uh, you know fellow South Africans. And I think it's important that we, we, we understand that we are actually one people and that the plight, for example, Chair, of the people of Zimbabwe is interwoven to the plight of, uh, of South Africa. I mean, South Africans must know, for example, that, uh, you know, 4% of our uh, exports goes to Mozambique and Botswana. They, 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 they must know that uh, because that is, that is a key issue. We export, for example, more to Botswana and Mozambique than we export to Belgium, Netherlands, or India. So our good fortunes uh, is intertwined to the economic plight of the rest of the, the Southern region. The sixth and second class aspiration, of course, uh, comrade uh, moderator, uh, we speak about the centrality of, um, of a people-driven process in Africa and the potential of the African people. And I think what we, we have seen is that there is what we call a democratic uh, dividend in Africa, where increasingly more uh, African uh, nations uh, uh, subject themselves to a democratic process. Uh, there is a less reluction of uh, African uh, leaders that when they lose an electoral process uh, where they are actually uh, clinging to uh, political power. So there is a people's driven uh, process in Africa. Uh, there, there, is a, there is a need for increased people to people uh, 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 contact uh, chairperson. And I think we, we should not only do that through these symbolic um, uh, indic indices such as making sure everyone knows the African Union, but we should do that through the advancement, obviously, of cultural uh, diplomacy. More South African student scholarship exchange programs should be with universities and higher education institutions, for example. In the, the last, the, yes, the last aspiration chair is really aspiration seven, where we say. Are we strong? Uh, are we an influential global uh, partner? And what I can indicate to Congress is that uh, Africa, of course, uh, is a is a esteemed member of the of the United Nations member community. South Africa, for example, is a, is is in the G20. We are in the G77 with China. When BRICS, APSA, uh, IPSA, IORA, the ACP, the o, the new OACPS. What we must determine, comrades and friends, is whether our membership in Africa, in the world, 
actually have then that type of democratic dividend for that will realize that prosperity which the founders of the AU have spoken about. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. Thank you very much, Honorable Deputy Minister. I hope Sileko will not blame you for calling him a comrade. <laughs> I really hope so. But thank you very much for your commentary. We will uh, continue because at two we are having a the debate on, on Africa Day. So we will now call on the second commenter, commentator to, to, to deliver his commentary. And that is the Honorable Ambassador Mohammed Dangor. Thank you once again, Honorable DM. Uh, thank you very much, uh, moderator, uh, chairperson of the NCOP, uh, Chief Whip, and other officials of the NCOP, Professor Eddie Maloka. Professor Maloka you reminded me of the scenario sketches of the pre-1994 period, and particularly the FTS one of the Icarus one, the one of the bird that flies away with hope. And I think that is what I want to engender today, following on from what you've been saying. In fact, there is hope in Africa. I just want to remind you, Professor Maloka, that you and I were dealing with the color revolutions in the MENA region. And strangely enough, uh, the Arabic word for these revolutions was Maidan re re uh, revolutions. Guess what? It's also called the Maidan revolution in Ukraine. So they exported the revolution without changing the name. Having said that, I think the theme for this year is the year of nutrition. Thus, our reflection and celebration should be done within the context of both the Africa Day theme but also the progress made in terms of our long-term objectives of Pan-Africanism. This year's theme of nutrition is an, an indicator of our people's health and welfare is intrinsically linked to the goals and objectives of the AU and the Africa we want, as well as the global and continental challenges that we are currently facing. In other words, we cannot have a 100% fully healthy continent within the context of nutrition without Africa's political and economic prosperity. Linked to this, we cannot have a political and economic prosperity without co continental unity and inclusive and diversified e uh, economic development. We cannot have inclusive and diversified economic development without peace. Today, this year, is therefore an opportunity to reflect on the state of nutrition on our continent celebrate African diversity and success, highlight the cultural economic potential that exists on the African continent and ac acknowledge the progress that Africans have made. I want to just broaden out on uh, what Professor had said uh, uh, about the seven pillars of the agenda 2063. And I think we need to remind ourselves that all, they are important. A prosperous Africa, based upon inclusive growth and sustainable development. Two, an integrated continent politically united and based on the ideals of Pan-Africanism and the vision of Africa's renaissance. An Africa of good governance, democracy, respect for human rights, justice and the rule of law. A peaceful and secure Africa. Five, an Africa with a strong identity, and the heritage shared values and ethics. An Africa where development of its people is driven relying on the potential of African people, especially its women and youth and, uh, and, and caring for children. Africa as a strong, united, resilient and influential global player. Honorable members, what has been done? Since the launch of the OAU, there has been slow but significant progress in reaching the goals of Pan-Africanism, uh, the economic liberation and integration. By 2002, when the OAU was dissolved, Africa, except for Western Sahara, had secured its independence, as in the case of South Africa, the end of apartheid. The new partnership for Africa, NEPAD, 
which aims to promote Africa's development through the promotion of democracy, human rights, accountability, transparency, and participatory governance. The, the AU embracement of the Ibrahim Index of African government, which is linked to clean governance, provides an annual assessment of the quality of governance in AU member states. It assesses the crucial areas of safety and the, the rule of law, participation, human rights, sustainable economic uh, development, and, and human development. The, uh, the establishment important of which the CEO is with us today is the establishment of the African peer review mechanism, which is a monitoring tool which has been developed by NEPAD. It aims to monitor governance, performance, and progress to ensure the promotion of political stability, accelerated sub-regional and continental and economic integration, economic growth and sustainability. The Africa Free, Free Trade ACFA, which is the largest free trade agreement since the creation of the World Trade Organization, African leaders signed the Kigali Declaration on the establishment of this trade agreement at the 10th Extraordinary Summit of the Assembly of Af the African Union in Kigali, Rwanda, on the 21st of May, 2018, and trade should commence soon. The silencing of guns, important. That is creating a conducive condition for Africa's development to achieve the goal of conflict-free Africa, which includes ending gender-based violence. It aims to resolve the scourge of domestic wars which have ravaged the continent. The AU Peace and Security Council has adopted this resolution in an effort to end the continental conflicts. I think I may miss the return to some kind of diplomacy. State-to-state -state diplomacy in, in, in answering the gun sometimes is not the only answer. Second track and third track diplomacy can actually assist in silencing the guns and Legislatures, when they're looking at budgets, need to actually look at that very critically because some of the things they will not be able to understand, it will not be disclosed to them, it will be top secret. But we need to understand what second, stay, uh, second track and third track and fourth track diplomacy is all about. Honorable members, there are challenges. Despite the progress that has been made in developing institutions and tools to strengthen democracy, human rights, and good governance, peace and stability, conflict prevention and reconstruction, and the development there remains numerous challenges and weaknesses in Africa that we have to overcome. So as we have to overcome the triple challenges of poverty, of inequality, and unemployment, it is up to us as part of the leadership in this country, as part of the leadership in Africa, and as part of the leadership in the world to build a better South Africa, a better Africa, and a better world, that we have to work towards such an agenda and such an objective. But such an objective means that, as in the case with the Ukraine, and we have to actually expand on the issue of what non-alignment actually means, because very people, few, few people understand what non-alignment means. They think that it, in fact, means neutrality. It does not mean neutrality. One of the issues of the non-aligned movement is a non-nuclear world. And that challenges both sides uh, in this particular conflict uh, about their, their, their nuclear arms. We need to look at how we can actually get to a point where we can obtain peace through negotiation peace through talking, and, uh, to talking rather than peace through guns. We are, I have our own experience in South Africa. We had an intractable problem, which some people saw. We actually got to the point where we could speak to each other, find the resolution. And sometimes I think we need to revisit that position because some of us are actually falling back into narrow nationalism, into tribalism, and we need to rekindle the uh, notion of non-racism, non-sectarianism, 
non-sexism and democracy. I thank you very much, moderator. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Dango. You never fail to surprise me. Thank you very much for your very, very informative input. We are continuing with the program and we will now call on our Honorable Chief Whip, the Honorable C. Sumohai, to do the vote of thanks, but also to overall summarize the event. Thank you very much. And over to you, Honorable Chief Whip. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director and uh, the moderator, the Deputy Chairperson of the NCOP, Honorable uh, Lucas and the chairperson of the NCOP, uh, Honorable uh, Masondo, the distinguished keynote speaker, uh, Professor Edima Loka, the chief executive of the African Peer Review Mechanism, our distinguished high-level uh, commentators, uh, uh, deputy minister, international relations and cooperation, and the former ambassador, uh, Ambassador Dango, uh, honorable members and ladies and gentlemen, this marks the end of yet another high level public engagement by this August House to mark Africa Day. Program director, I'm sure that honorable members will agree that this will do not on this. We, we do not only do to celebrate the formation of African unity 59 years back, but most importantly, to reaffirm its ideals and vision in shaping our collective future. As we do this, we look back with great sense of pride, the significant milestones Africa has achieved in pursuance of the vision of Africa's unity. Key among these are the establishment of the Pan-African Parliament, adoption of the African peer review mechanism, the Agenda 2063, and the African Free Trade Agreement. Deputy Chair, as the keynote speaker has noted, our task of Africa's renewal and development unfold within the changing global context in multiple fronts, governance and politics, climate and environment, science and technology, energy and security, deepening levels of poverty, unemployment and inequality, natural disasters and pandemics and endemics. This requires new state capabilities and resilience and most significantly cooperation between state and non-state sectors. First, within Africa and across the globe. Accordingly, this cooperation cannot be neutral in the context of glaring unequal economic and political correlations between the rich North and the poor uh, countries in the South. Honorable members, this call for a fundamental paradigm shift in how we seek to situate the role of parliament as an apex institution of democracy in giving voice to the voiceless majority. It cannot be that parliament role remain limited to ratifying international instrument, but must extend to give voice to our people in the design, implementation, and monitoring of policy interventions. Program director, to the extent that we do not rise to the challenge, the more the role of parliament becomes a talk show. This is particularly so when democracy and its institutions are facing great challenge of legitimacy in the eyes of our people. As we close this important public engagement today, allow me to thank especially our keynote speaker, Professor Edi Maloga, the chairperson of the NCOP and the deputy chairperson, and most importantly, the leadership of various political parties represented uh, in our council for agreeing to this event. There is no doubt that this was indeed enriching for policy thought and action I'm certain that our people and the entire international community will cast their eyes firmly on the television screen to watch our debates this afternoon and how they will give concrete policy perspective in taking some of the thoughts forward for Africa's renewal. So this is not the end, it's not just an event, but we will formulate ways and means of further engaging uh, with Professor Maloka, uh, particularly on the issues critical that he has raised about building strong institutions that will sustain us beyond our times. Thank you very much uh, for this event. It was really worth uh, to engage in this very critical area of our work. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.
Chief Whip, and thank you very much to everyone who made a success of this specific event. On going out, we will now request the admin to, uh, to play the two anthems, the South African National Anthem, as well as the Anthem of the African Uni Union, the, yeah, the African Union uh, Anthem, to conclude the debate or the, the event of today. Once more, we express our appreciation to the team of Parliament for making sure that whenever we request them, we make sure that there is success of whatever event we want to, to, to have. And also, like the Chief Whip said, this could not be the end of our engagement, particularly on the APRM program. We would love to have more engagement, and we believe that the Chief will lead us in that regard. Over to you as host officials, can you please play the anthems for us? Thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you, Prof. Deputy Minister. Thank you. 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 Thank if we, if <laughs> Thanks. that's wonderful, we will have to call from No, that the, was great, bro. The, they are, Thanks. Uh, th thanks for the idea. We are not all comrades. We are not all comrades. Yes, we know, ah, Sileko. We are all I comrades, yeah. <laughs> for, for, <laughs> that's a politic part that sorry, we must sort out briefly. Sorry, my bro. Sorry, my bro. Sorry, Isaac. <laughs> I see I'm just... I'm alone here, so I am defeated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you must rest the fire. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Thank you, thank you very much. We'll speak again.